got your Bibles, let's turn over to the book of Matthew and Matthew in chapter 26. I'm going to attempt for the next month with the help of Brother Sammy. We've got some things all the way up to Easter. When we were down in Guatemala City last week, they, they started Lent last Sunday. And it is a preparation of things that they do all the way up to Easter. And I, and I believe that. I think that's a good idea. I think that, that, that we should spiritually and mentally prepare ourselves. Uh, there's a lot of ways, Deke, that we can do that. I'll be honest with you. Y'all want, you want me to tell you one. I'm going to tell you a way to prepare yourself. How to prepare yourself. How can I prepare myself as Christians? Y'all ready for this? Go to Sunday school. Seriously. Seriously. Go to Sunday school. It's very important. I don't know how many times that Deke, Brother Don, Sister Marchie, Brother Sammy has come to me after I preach something, and most of them have no idea what I'm going to preach. You say, Joey, you have no earthly idea how close that was to what we were talking about in Sunday school. Sunday school is a time to prepare yourself. Even this week, when I start preparing myself to preach, I spend the first part of the, work, the week studying what I'm going to preach. In the latter part of the week, I'm studying for Sunday school. And when I got to my Sunday school lesson, I just laughed. You know, because I, I was laughing because part of that Sunday school lesson is preparation for what this is. Brother Gary Udy, I met him last week when we were in Guatemala City. We were sitting at the airport. And uh, Gary told me, he said, uh, he said, Joey, I want to come to your church and talk about missions, you know, if you'll get me a day when you come back. And I said, Gary, you, you, just, you just say when. You know, Gary's lived down there for 10 years, and he spent a lot of time in Guatemala City. And I said, you just say when. He said, and, then he, and then he followed it up with, I want to come talk to your Sunday school all your Sunday school people, about missions. And that one stumped me. I said, dude, you can talk to the whole church. I want you to talk to the whole church. He said, I don't want to talk to the whole church. I just want to talk to the people in Sunday school. And he said, why? I said, well, why would you only want to talk to people in Sunday school? He said, Joey, if they're not prepared to go to Sunday school, they're not coming down here. <laughs> and I thought, he's right. There's some preparation in what we have to do as Christians to get ourselves in the right place to go down a path for God. So Sunday school, it's my little piece for just a minute, is a, is a great time to prepare ourselves for what God has in here. So if you got your Bibles, turn over to the book of Matthew in chapter 26. Matthew in chapter 26. And we're going to read one verse. I want to talk about some things that are, that are going to happen, that are going to happen from the, from the night of the Last Supper all the way through the garden next week. I've talked with Brother Sammy. He's going to, he's going to do something that he did last fall in, in Bible study, and he did such a great job with it that I asked him to do this the week before Easter, and he's going to do that the Sunday before Easter, and he's going to do something we did last fall that, that was just a, a great review of everything that happened that evening up to the cross. And uh, So I'm looking forward to that. So what I want to do for that is I want you all to be praying for us. Praying as we prepare, as we get ourselves prepared and that's what we as Christians should do this church isn't just coming in here to, to waste an hour of your day or two hours of your day it's preparation time so let's prepare ourselves so the Bible has for us in Matthew 26 verse 28 and the Bible says this for this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins brother Deke if you don't mind would you lead us in prayer and pray over God's word this morning amen, amen. What's, what's so hard for me sometimes in the ministry, and it is hard, and, and me and Lynn talk about this, is, is I, I can lose my focus really fast, and, and Lawrence, I do. I, I like talking about things. and Some of the elements of the things that we're going to talk about and the things that I'm going to look at, some of the things that I'm going to look at that, that God's going to allow me, I, I want to look at some lessons and some things that we learned. And, and that last night, that last night that, 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 that Christ experienced at the Last Supper, I think is, is, is one of the most important one of the most important times in the New Testament. And it is. It's, 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 it's a time that, that when Jesus had come to his disciples, Christ knew what was going on. It's amazing sometimes in life when, when you, you're trying to prepare people around you because you know what's going on and other people may not be ready for what's going on. I, I think, have you ever been around somebody that's, that's getting ready to die as an older person or a friend? And they know. And sometimes that person will sit there and, and talk with you and, and help you feel okay with the situation because they know. They know where they're going. They know they're, and, and a lot of times it's, it's, it's amazing to me that person as they're getting ready to, 
to pass on from this earth to heaven. That, that they'll spend more time trying to make you because they know they're okay. And so the, the time that Jesus was getting ready to spend with his disciples, he knew was some of the last moments. And I, I think just the book of John in and of itself, the, 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 the book of John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16 are some of the greatest places. It's one of the greatest spiritual places in the Bible to me because it's a conversation that Christ had with them from the moment that he left the Last Supper all the way into the garden. And it is, and it's a, it's a time that I like. But, but today I want to talk about some things that happened that night. I want to talk about, I know there are a lot, I think each is its own thing, but, but we're going to talk about a couple of things that, ha that happened that night. And in John chapter 13, 14, the Bible says that, that if, if you thee being the Lord and your master have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. One of the greatest lessons that, that, that Jesus taught on that night is service to each other. I, I, I think that, that in Christianity in our walk, one of the things that we have the hardest time with, that we have the hardest time with, the thing that we can't digest, the thing that we can't understand, is that we're here to serve each other. Y'all are not here as a church to serve me. I'm not your Lord and I'm not your master. I, I'm a minister. My, my job and the word minister in and of itself means I'm here to serve. And I, I'll be honest with you, I, I think that being a minister and being part of this ministry is one of the greatest honors that I've ever had in my life. The honor to serve other people. There's a, a ministry that we have in this church a couple of weeks ago, some weeks back. We ordained a couple more young men to get into the deacon ministry. The deacon ministry is not a leadership ministry. It's not. A lot of churches for the last hundred years in the Baptist church, they've taken the deacon ministry and they, they look at it as a deacon board and a deacon group of people who lead the church. But the deacon ministry was never intended. It was never intended to lead the church. It had a sole purpose. Its purpose was to minister and serve the church. Those guys, I, I love Johnny Hunt. He once said, that a deacon, if they do their job right, it is the hardest job in the church. It really is. It's harder than what the ministry is because when you look in the book of Acts and it talks about that, the ministers were having such a tough time serving the people, they looked out and said, hey, go find some people that can help you do these things. So the ministry, the deacon ministry, can be one of the hardest ministries in, a serve, in the church. But to do those things, to serve in the church, you have to have the right heart. You have to have the right heart. Not everybody, and I mean this, y'all, I don't mean this in a negative way, but not everybody has a servant heart. And so on the night of the Last Supper, Jesus does to me what is one of the greatest things in the Bible, and he shows, the great master shows us how to have a servant's heart. One of the most demeaning things at that time they had servants was washing people's feet. So if they had servants in the house, and those of you that study your Bible and understand history, if they had servants, if there was a cook, if there was a guy that cleaned, if they had all these different servants in the house, the lowliest of those servants was the guy that had to wash all the visitors' feet. Now you think about that. So there's, you know, like, man, I got to be the cook, or I get to be the guy that's making the beds, or I get to be the lady that's, that's cleaning the toilet. But the worst job in the whole house, because they were was a guy that washed feet. So understanding that that night, when Jesus put himself in a place where he would serve his disciples, and he set an example. I had somebody tell me the other day that, that they said, Brother Joey, have you ever been part of a marriage ceremony where the husband and wife washed each other's feet? And I said, you know, I have not, but what an awesome idea. What an awesome idea in marriage that when two people come together, that they take the service idea toward each other, that you looked at your husband and your wife looked at her husband and the husband looked at his wife, that they're there to serve each other's needs. What's wrong with the church today? What's wrong with the church today is we think that everybody's here to serve our needs. Y'all hear me out. We, we come into this place and we want people to serve our needs and our wants and how can they help me or what can the church do for me. Jesus taught us that night that the thing that we need to look to more than anything is being put ourselves in a place where we're there to serve other people's needs. 
Brother Jim, think of a place, a church, and have you ever experienced a church, Sammy, that when you were part of a congregation, that everybody was there to serve each other's needs. So Jesus taught us something that in washing each other's feet, and I know that a lot of people are like, Joe, I ain't washing somebody's nasty feet. When I was preaching at my little church, I call it the little church that we first started at, some 20 years ago when the kids were growing up, I had an idea. How many of y'all ever got to be part of a foot washing in church in your life? Maybe there's not enough foot washings going on anymore. <laughs> so we're going to have to do that one Sunday night. I had an idea one Sunday morning. I told Maggie and Max and Matthew, they were younger. I think they were 10, 11, 12 in their age, and there was a couple other kids in that church. I said, I went to them the week before and said, hey, here's a message I'm going to do Sunday about washing people's feet. And I told the kids this. I told the kids, I said, hey, I want y'all to be prepared. And, you know, and initially, the, you know what the kids' reaction to this was? Y'all know what the kids' reaction to this was? No, believe it or not, it wasn't. Their reaction, and this is why I love kids, their reaction was, whatever you want us to do, Preacher Joey. Whatever you want us to do. Now, I, I agree, Scott, if I told adults to do that, that's the reaction I would get. <laughs> but the kids, believe it or not, a hundred times out of a hundred are usually pretty easy to convince to go do something that's in God's Word. Adults, sometimes they think, we think it's demeaning. But I want you to understand something in this relationship, in this moment in time. This is something that Christ commanded all of us to do. If I wash your feet, you should be willing to wash others. And what he's trying to say to us, if I wash your feet, you should be willing to serve others. Do what it takes. Demean yourself. And that's, I think, really hard for most of us to do. So I told the kids that day, we brought the stuff in there. Funny thing about it, Sister Jackie, is most of the people I said when I got in there said, I said, hey, we're going to have a little foot washing thing after we did a message. Everybody kind of stared at us. Finally got a volunteer. Finally got a volunteer come up there. And then another person. I kind of had everybody prayer. Then I had another person said, well, and as time went on that morning in that church, it absolutely changed the whole atmosphere in a little church back there in Rootville, Georgia. Changed the whole atmosphere. And then there were adults that were coming and said, Joey, I don't want y'all to wash my feet. I want to wash your feet. I want to do this. God changed us. God let us see that there was something important in demeaning ourselves, okay? We want to think a lot of ourselves. Jesus said that night, it's important that we sometimes demean ourselves. And then he taught us as he sat there with Judas that not everybody is in this for the right reason. Did y'all know that? That's, that's what's neat when I come into this building. Probably one of the hardest things that I'll ever do in being a minister or teaching in a church, a lot of y'all view Judas as you've read about him in your life. You viewed him as a traitor, as somebody who whatever. But I'm a, if you really read things that happened and transpired in history, there was something different about Judas. Judas wanted Jesus to be the king. You see, they were looking for a king. They were looking for a king that was going to come. They were looking for a king that was going to conquer. They were looking for a king that was going to kick out the Romans. He was looking for Jesus to be something else. And I know, I know that a lot of y'all would say, Brother Joey, I think that's crazy. What does that have to do with today? Because I'm going to tell y'all something. Not everybody that sits in this room today is looking for the right thing from Jesus. We're not. We're not looking for the right thing for Jesus. Jesus had a purpose on this earth. There are people that have come in here today and they say, Joe, I want Jesus to, I want Jesus to make me financially better off. Jesus, I, want, I want Jesus to heal my... I want Jesus... To, you know what? We've got... Hey, not everybody in this room, believe it or not, is in the right frame set or the right mindset about what Jesus should be in our life. They're not. So what's hard in a church sometimes as we all come together, it's hard to digest that not everybody's in here for the right reason. Y'all know that? Y'all ever thought about that? Not everybody's in here for the right reason. Do you know that there are a lot of people in this, this building that are in here for themselves, believe it or not? They're in here for about 
what they want or what they can get out of the church or what the church can give to them. And you know what? And when they look at how they come and what they do, they think to themselves, man, if God could bless me, if God could do... Listen, not the right reason. Not saying you're a bad person, but you don't have the right reason. Jesus that night, as, as he looked at Judas, that sat with the twelve, he reminds us that not all the time are people in this for the right reason. I, I was listening to some people that talked about missions. I get, I get, a, little, I get a little frustrated. I'm going to get off in the left field for a second. I, I get a little frustrated about missions. I do. Because I don't think everybody serves them for the right reason. And, I, and I've, I ask God to help me with this. I am not a fan of the vacation mission trips. I'm not. I'm not. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with y'all. You, you say, Joe, Brother Joe, I'm not. I, I, when me and Lynn were in Guatemala City last week and I saw the people that need help, I don't think us spending money to get on airplanes and fly down there and go sightseeing and go to a Bible school for a day or two and fly back home and make ourselves feel good about ourselves because we saw a bunch of poor people working. I don't know that we've accomplished anything. Now, I'm going to tell you what I think missions are. I think missions are people who get committed to God to go into the mission field. Gary Udy was an example of that. Where you go live with those people. Brother Tommy Harris, who is a good friend to me, who lives in Uganda. I think those people have the right mindset and the right heart set to go help somebody, to get down the right path for somebody. I don't think that all of us, and I told me and Gary as we talked about it, he said, Joey, not everybody's got the right mindset about missions. And I'll be honest with you, it's a little like Judas was. There are more Judases in the church than we know. And you say, Joey, are you telling me there's a lot of traitors here? I'm not trying to explain that there's a lot of traitors here. I'm trying to explain that there are a lot of people in this building who are not necessarily here for the right reason. They're not here for the right reason. And that's what we try to work on. Thirdly, I'm going through some things, and I know I'm going through them rather quickly. Jesus institutes that night. Jesus institutes that night the Lord's Supper. He takes a moment in time to give us something, which is one of the two ordinances that we have in, in the New Testament church. And, 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 and J Brother Joey, what is, what is an ordinance? An ordinance is a command. It's something that we are commanded to do. There are a lot of things that we think that we would like to do. The New Testament church has two ordinances that we are commanded to do through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And those two things are number one, baptism, and number two, the Lord's Supper. And you could, put, you could say number one, the Lord's Supper, and number two, baptism. Put it whatever order you want to. But there are two things that we are commanded to do. Now, number one, I don't know how you sit here. There are a lot of people that will sit here and say that, Brother Joey, I don't need to be baptized to be saved. And you would be 100% correct. Next week, we're going to get to baptize somebody. I think on the 17th, I'm looking forward to it. Little Rennie's going to be coming to be baptized, and we're looking forward to that day. But see, here's the problem. You can be saved and not be baptized. But you can't be saved and be obedient without being baptized. You can't do those two things. So you've got to be, you have to be baptized to be obedient. I've known a lot of Christians in my walk that chose not to be baptized and say, Joe, the, the guy that was sitting on the cross was never baptized. You're 100% right, he wasn't. Do I think he made it to heaven? I 100% believe that he did. I believe. But as a Christian today who walks and who lives, we can't do that. Partaking of the Lord's Supper is, is, is just as important. It is one of the most important things in the whole New Testament. I, I want to take a time. I'm more worried about the time today than I am anything that I shouldn't be. And Jesus sat there with the disciples in Matthew 26 through 28, and he said, And they said, Eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and break it. And he gave it to the disciples. He said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took of the cup and he gave it, and he gave it to them. Drank you all, for this is the blood of the New Testament. Jesus institutes something into the Christian walk that it's not a situation where we're eating his body, nor are we drinking his blood. About a month ago, 
I preached a message about remembering. And, I, and I've been in a lot of different churches in my life. Sammy, I think you and Wanda probably have too. I've been in a lot of different churches. I've been, I spent some time in the Methodist church. Jimmy, I, Lynn and them grew up Pentecostal. I've seen a lot of people do things different ways. I had a friend of mine that was a Catholic. I've been in the Catholic church. I didn't spend time in a Catholic church, but I've been there. And a lot of people do this a different way. Some people do it every week. There are churches out there that they will have communion every week. They do. And I, and I listen. I'm, I want you to hear me say something. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. There are some churches that'll, that'll they'll have it every quarter. They'll have it four times a year. There are some churches that I've been part of that have communion once a year. There are some churches like us that will do it on Easter and Christmas and Thanksgiving. We'll do it at different times, a couple times a year. And you know what? And the Bible doesn't delineate as to what's right or wrong. But what it does delineate is what's going on when we do those things, which we're paying attention to what we're doing. Jesus said, when you do it, I want you to be thinking about me. Now, I was saved at a young age. And y'all hear me out with this. Steve, you hear me out with this one. I was saved when I was a young man. I make a big deal about it at Bible school every year because I was saved in Bible school. And I'm grateful for that. That's why Bible school is important to me. I believe had it not been for somebody teaching a Bible school or taking I wouldn't be here today. But when I, I was raised different than a lot of people in this room, and what I mean by that, as I had a Christian mom and I had a Christian dad, and I understand that not everybody was raised in that, in that world. I get it. So there's some people say, Joey, my, mom, my dad hated God. My mom and dad didn't go to church. I get that. I, I, I say this to be thankful. I was raised by a Christian mom and a Christian dad. They've taken me to church. I see my little grandchild Mallory back there. They have taken me to church since I first came into this world. Okay? They raised me there. You know, my mama was the no excuses kind. It didn't matter if you were sick or dying, you were going to church. You know what I'm saying? No matter what happened, they were going to have us there. And that's just, a, that's the world I lived in. That's the world I was raised in. But my dad taught me something else that was very important. My dad taught me, TJ, that Jesus didn't live in this building. Y'all hear me out. He said... He lives right here. Now, how many of y'all believe Jesus lives right here? I do. It's not like some of y'all are, I hope he does. But hear me out. And so I want to tell y'all something. I'm not telling y'all that I've never sinned, because I would be lying to say that. But there are a lot of things in my life, a lot of bridges that I never crossed. I will say this. I have never been drunk in my entire life. I'm going to tell you all that. I want, I want you all to hear that. I want you to hear me. Hear me out. I've never been drunk in my entire life. I have never in my life drank a beer. Listen, I'm not getting on beer drinking. If you hear me saying something, Joey said we can't drink light. I drank light beer, Brother Joey. <laughs> I drank the good stuff. Less alcohol. Don't miss me. Don't miss me, Steve. My dad told me something that was hard to live with, Lee. He said, Joey, Jesus ain't in the building. He's in your heart. And he's everywhere you go. He's everywhere you go. So, Lawrence, if I were to go into a bar, if I would shout profanity, if I would chose to do drugs, if I would have chose to cheat on my wife, if I would have chose to go down paths that I know to be sinful, Brother Clifford, that were wrong, listen to me, listen to me. I took Jesus with me every step of the way. And what Jesus was saying, listen to this, when he was instituting the Lord's Supper, I want you to remember what I did for you. Some of us forget what he has done. They, at the time, the disciples had no clue. They had no clue, Debbie, where this was going. They had no clue. What is he talking about? Jesus was trying to say, I want you to remember 
And every step of the way, listen, listen, y'all, listen. Our walk and our life should be a witness of our Savior. Every step of the way. Remember what I did for you. I don't care if you take communion once a week or once a year. But Jesus said, I want you to remember that I sacrificed. I want you to remember that I spilled my blood. Remember that. My dad nailed that into my heart. And so times when I walk away, and me and Mike and Matthew have had this conversation when I say or when I do something, Jimmy, when I say or I do something, I have to stop and take a pause and say, Father, forgive me. I'm sorry you had to see that. I'm sorry you had to see that part of my life. Then Jesus says something that's pretty important that kind of spilled over to me in Sunday school that I love so much. He said, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, in Sunday school this morning, we were studying something. We've been studying the names of God. One of them was up here singing and showed sent me one of my notes and reminded me of the the thought, Adonai, the God that wants to have a relationship with me. We've been studying all these names of God. And, 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 and originally, we got 52 things we were going to study. And originally, we were going to talk, we were going to do it for eight weeks and stop. I can't stop. Because <laughs> every week I get another one that just hits me. Well, this week I got to this one. And the thought of the week was Yahweh Rofi. Now, there's a story about Moses in the Old Testament. Joy, where is this going? The story about Moses in the Old Testament is back there in Exodus. And the children of Israel came to a place really quickly where they got to get hold of some bitter water. And God, and Moses calls on God, the children, what are we going to drink? What are we going to do? And the Bible tells us that, that he told Moses to throw something into the water, told him to throw, throw a tree into the water. And he took very bitter water. He took very bitter water and he made it sweet. Jesus said he shed his blood for the remission of our sins. Now I want to explain to you an Old Testament thought or a great New Testament idea. Jesus said, I shed my blood for the remission of your sins. Now the word rofi means this. If I'm saying it wrong, I apologize. It means three things. Yahweh rofi it means three things. And I love this deep. It means I am the God that cures. I am the God that heals. And I am the God that restores. Amen. Now let me explain what the blood of Jesus can do for you. Number one, number one, it can cure you. Those of you today that have a sinful walk, some of you that continue down a sinful walk, you hear me out. I'm different. I believe that when a person comes to know Jesus Christ, there is a change. Come on, give me that amen on that. Amen. Listen to me, Brother Dennis. Listen. Jesus, Jesus isn't something that is applied to sin. Jesus' blood is a cure for sin. Hear me out. He's a cure for sin. Rope. He's a cure for my sin. So number one, he's cured it, Brother Tommy. He's cured me. And what that means is I'm not going to be an alcoholic anymore. It means I'm not going to have to use drugs. Hey, listen. I'm not going to be dependent on the sin anymore because my God's blood has cured me. Number two, it heals me. I want to tell you something, folks. If we were anything when Jesus came into our lives and the blood was put on us, we were broken. Broken. You ever talk to people who were part of a broken marriage? 
I'm telling you, man, people that are in broken marriages sometimes, Steve, and I've, I've witnessed and we have, we've all talked, they have, you can say what you want, people can say what they want, but even though they may get remarried and find somebody that makes them happy, there's a brokenness that's always back there. And any of you that's ever experienced that in your life, you know what I'm talking about. But I'm going to tell you something about Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus. It heals me. It heals me. And you know what healing is? Deacon lets me know that it's okay. Jesus said, I got this. But Lord, you don't understand what I did. Lord, you don't understand what I went through. Listen, Jesus said, listen, you've had sin on your life. I'm about to put a healing on you. And there are a lot of people that are in churches today, listen, they have not been cured and they have not been healed because the blood of Jesus is sitting on them. That's the truth, y'all. But number three, it does something pretty important, Jim. It restores us. Now, there was a joke when I was down there in Guatemala. And Lynn sent out to a couple people. She had me go over in front of a confession booth and take a picture. And I, I don't know if she said it to Sammy. Did you get the picture, Sammy? Joey had to go, waiting in line to go through confession. Listen to me. There are a lot of people on this earth today, and I'm not mad at them. They think that they got to go talk to somebody. Listen. They think that they got to go talk to somebody. They got to go tell somebody. They got to go ask somebody. They got to go ask for permission of somebody to get to God and tell them that their sins are okay. But listen to this the blood of Jesus, hear me out. It restores me. Guess what, Debbie? I can have that conversation with the Father. Brother Jerry, listen to me. I don't have to go to a priest. Listen to you come to me and Brother Sammy and say, Joey, you, hey, I'll pray for you. I will pray for you. Listen, you, Joey, I'm going through this. You don't know what I'm going through. I'm having this problem in my life. Will you and Sammy pray for me? Will you get the day? Hey, yes, I will. I will pray for you. But I want to tell you something. Listen, when you got the blood of Jesus on your life, there's a restoration that happened. Brother Steve, I want to tell you something. I, I, I ain't getting on nobody in this room. They're some wonderful Christian people. There are some wonderful Christian people in this room. Hear me out. But ain't nobody in this room can plead my case to the Father like I can plead my case to the Father. You hear me? They ain't nobody can go to Him, Toby, like I can go to Him and say, God, Listen, God, you got to know what's going on right now. My God, you got to understand. Listen, nobody can plead my case like I can. And I'm going to tell y'all something. Nobody can plead your case like you can. Amen. And the blood of Jesus Christ restores us before the Father. That's what Jesus said. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We don't, we don't focus enough on what the blood of Jesus has done for our lives. We think sometimes, well, Joey, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to listen to me, y'all. I get up every morning in my life. I get in a truck. I turn on, some, I turn on, I turn on something called the message little Christian station. And listen, I get up start praising God. I get to work. I start reading about God. Because listen to this. I serve a God that has cured me. I serve a God that has healed me. And I serve a God that has restored me. Jesus said, I gave you this blood. You know what I had to do? Tell me what I had to do. Y'all ready for this teaching? You know what I had to do? I had to go climb a mountain? Do I have to go write a book? Did I have to go tell a million people? Did I have to go, did I have to go across the country? Was there some checklist of things that I had to do to get Jesus to do that? No. That's the saddest thing that, that's going to hit me for some of us. And y'all, there's, there's some people that are sitting in this room. Believe it or not, I'd love to think that there weren't. All of us in this room share something in common. We will all meet God. Amen. It's just on what terms we meet Him. Some of us are going to meet Him as our Savior. And some of us are going to meet Him as our judge. 
And when you sit there and you say, well, 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 God, I tried to go to Sunday school. And God, I tried to read your word. And God, I tried to work at Hope for the Hungry. And God, look at my list. There's nothing that any of us could do. Not one thing. You see, he did it. This is what's cool. He did it. He made it right. And all I had to do was accept it. You mean to tell me, Joey? You mean to tell me all these times I didn't have to go to church? I didn't have to. You're, you're preaching Sunday school. Man, you're making, telling me I need to be there. I didn't have to do any of that stuff. Let me explain something to you. You didn't have to do any of it. But here's the kicker. When Jesus gets in here, you won't do every bit of it. That's the evidence of it. He healed, he healed me, he cured me, and he restored me. And only he could do it. So I ask you today, has Jesus healed you? Has Jesus cured you? Has Jesus restored you? The God who heals, who cures, and restores. How did he do it, Joey? He did it through his son, who died on a cross for our sins. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we love you. I want to take this time and thank you for watching and worshiping with us today. My name is Joey Dibman. I'm with Concord Missionary Baptist Church. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ and have never asked him to come into your heart, I'd like to take a few moments to help you do just that. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You know, this is open to every one of us that requests because Romans 10, 13 goes on to say even deeper, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So today, if you would like to pray with me, let's bow our heads in prayer to our Lord and Savior and ask him if you're seeking him to come into your heart today. Lord, I just want to take the opportunity that if there's someone out there today, and dear God, Lord, they're seeking you, dear God, Lord, and maybe they're at a place in their life where they can't see, but today through the Holy Spirit, which has pricked their heart through your word, not the words that I preach, but through the Holy Word, of an awesome Father. God, I pray today, dear God, Lord, that they would be enlightened. And God, I, I'd ask them today to pray with me and say, Lord, I want to be a believer. Dear God, Lord, I want to believe in the fact that I know that you walked on this earth. Lord, I want to know that you died for my sins. God, I want to believe in the fact that on the third day you resurrected from a tomb and you sit on the right hand of God. And today, Lord, I want to ask you to come into my heart. And Lord, if there's one out there praying with us today, dear God, Lord, that's seeking you, Lord, I pray that they would say this prayer with me today, dear God, Lord, and invite Jesus Christ into their heart to forgive their sins. Lord, we thank you for your blessings upon us. God, we thank you for what you're doing for us. I just pray that you'd be with us through this moment in time. And dear God, Lord, and show us the things that you'd have us to see. In Christ's name we pray, Lord. Amen. You know, if you've done that today, if you've taken the opportunity to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, you know, he died on a cross close to 2,000 years ago and he walked on the earth. The Bible teaches us that everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord and believes in their heart that he has risen from the grave shall be saved. So if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior today, you know, I want to invite you to, you know what, into your new relationship with your Father. And I want to to maybe help you, maybe through watching the videos as you learn and you grow, but maybe try to find a, a church that's close to you, a church home where you can go with other believers and walk with them and learn to grow with them. I invite you today also that maybe if today you've asked Christ to come into your heart, that, that you know what, maybe you would let us know and drop us a postcard to say, you know, hey, I listen to these videos on YouTube. I appreciate what you've done, but I would like for y'all to know that on this date, on so-and-so, that I ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart. We'd invite you, and, and if you look at the address that's on the screen today, and, and maybe send a postcard, and then, you know what, if you don't want to write it down, maybe through email. There will be a, an email address that you can address to our church at Concord Missionary Baptist Church, 
And you could just email us and let us know what's going on in your life. But even better than that out there today, maybe you are a, a Christian today and maybe you're not here in Temple, Georgia with us, but you're in your walk with Jesus today and you're, you're having some valleys that you're having to go through. And, and maybe you need some, to seek some prayer requests and some other shoulders to lean on. I invite you to also to email us or drop us a card. We meet on Wednesday nights to pray. We take these things before the Father. We take these things very seriously. and We come together as a group as we pray to our Father. So I'd invite you to, to send those prayer requests to us, and I promise you that we'll take them and put them on the altar and bring them before the Lord. Once again, I want to thank so much for you taking your time to come spend with us and worship with us, you know, through song, through word, but more, more than anything else, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God bless you and your family.